we can open the book of Luke, chapter 7. We mentioned the first week or two ago. We'll look at it a little different today. Uh, pray for Bible Baptist Nityville also. They ask if I would come fill in their services on the 24th. Amen. Luke chapter 7, verse 34. The Pharisees were <clears throat> well, always hypocritical, even contradicting themselves sometimes. Right. I'm going to read verse 33 to see what I mean here. But it says, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say he hath the devil. So they accused John the Baptist because he. He wasn't much of a socializer. And then it says of Christ, the Son of Man is coming, eating and drinking, and you say, Behold, a gluttonous man, a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. So then Jesus was a bit more of a social type, and mm -hmm. yet they accused him of being a, a sinner and friend of sinners. Mm -hmm. I would like us to look at really what a friend Jesus is, though. Amen. Certainly he is a friend to sinners, but not the way the Pharisees meant it here. So they were accusing him of approving and even being partakers of their sins. And we might say being buddies with sinners, but that's not the type of friend that Jesus is. Amen. You can be sure he will never approve our sin. But he is one that bears our sins and our sorrows. He is a friend that was tempted in all points like as we were, according to Hebrews 4.15. And Amen. In so doing, he understands what we face, and he, we can go to him for help when we have needs. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 4.16 tells us that. And so, over to Proverbs for a moment, and look at a few characteristics of a good friend, and how ultimately they're fulfilled in Christ. Proverbs 17, For the Pharisees to accuse him of being a friend of public and sinners, though, that must mean he was around them. Right. Not that he was down at the bar drinking with them or something like that, but that he was socializing with them in a sense. Mm -hmm. But we certainly should not have fellowship done through the works of darkness. The Bible was playing on that. But yet we should be friendly towards the world. Amen. We'll never, as I mentioned, we'll never win any to Christ if we're rude and hateful towards them. Right. Okay, Proverbs 17, verse 17 says, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Mm -hmm. well, a real friend will love you all the time. And certainly Christ always loves us. Amen. I know Brother Larry mentions that sometimes those good time friends aren't really your friends. That's exactly right. Yeah. So the Proverbs mentioned how the riches will get you friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll, it'll get you friends while you have the riches. Though. Right. A real friend is one who doesn't love you for what you can have to offer them. That's how many quote unquote friends how many of the, how the world acts as your friend. Mm -hmm. It's what you can offer them, what you can give them, what they can benefit from you. But no, Christ, he loves us even when we were, had nothing to offer him. Amen. In fact, when we were yet sinners, he died for us. That's it. We were in complete enmity with him, and yet, in the sense, he was our friend even then. Amen. He loved us then, and he loves us now, and he will love us despite all of our faults and failures. That is a real friend. Yeah. And as really, I think all of us, if we're not careful, we will we'll fall short of that mark, won't we? Hey, Amen. Mm -hmm. If a friend does something to hurt or offend us, we're easily 
turned away from him, aren't we? But yet Christ loves us no matter what. Mm -hmm. Going over chapter 18 of Proverbs, verse 24. It says, the man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Right. Not only does he always love us, he will never leave us. It says he sticketh closer than a brother. It also says that he, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Mm -hmm. Seems like it should be common sense, but you know, <laughs> if I was never friendly to Brother Larry, he probably wouldn't want to be friends with me. <laughs> Yeah. But so is Christ friendly towards us and really towards we see in his ministry he was friendly towards sinners as the Pharisees accused him. Amen. Certainly he preached repentance and said if you repent you shall likewise perish was his message multiple times. Yet he didn't go around except to the Pharisees saying stuff condemning them necessarily, do you? Right. When the woman was caught in adultery, he didn't say, well, you adulterous woman, you're going to hell, you better be right. <laughs> no, he said, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. Amen. No, he called the Pharisees out, and they, they deserved it, they needed that. But generally speaking, he was much more forgiving than we are. That's exactly right. Story Proverbs 27. Verse number six it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but mm -hmm. the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Right. And with his reproof, his rebuke, his correction, all those things are for our good. Even though they may feel like wounds, but yet. Because they're faithful, they're only really for our betterment, if you will. Right. Christ never does anything that's really for our detriment. You. Sometimes it may seem hurtful to uh, the flesh, but yet all things work together for our good. That's it. Amen. Really, to them who are love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. That's it. Be. But yes, even what we perceive as wounds are for our good. So sometimes it's just to point us to our need for Him. But a real friend will will reprove and rebuke and exhort. A real friend will correct. Amen. I, if I saw Brother Larry fix walk out in front of a car, I'd say, well, you might get offended if I say something to him. <laughs> That's how we act about sin, though, isn't it? For mm -hmm. mm -hmm. a real friend will say something, not in a condemning way, but mm. how well, we ought not to be afraid of speaking the truth, though. Amen. Even if that causes wounds, if they're done in a biblical manner, they're for that person's good. Mm -hmm. Even so, so much more Christ does to us. The Bible says that itself, it, the word of God is a two edged sword dividing the sunder of the. Quite told it, right? It, it pierces going in and coming out, doesn't it? It hey, Sometimes the word of God is hurtful to this flesh, but yet it's always needful. Amen. Let's go back to John chapter 15. Uh, probably first verse, probably a very familiar verse. I think sometimes it's complete meaning is overlooked though. Uh, John 15 verses 13 and 14 say, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Amen. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Mm-hmm. You know, know, everyone points to his death, and that was part of it. He gave his entirety of his life. Right. You know, 
from really from birth, all the way through his ministry, even to his death, Christ gave his life for us. And I think it's in First John it says, if he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Amen. We ought to have the same love towards one another that Christ had towards us. But he says, there is no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friend. And certainly Christ was a perfect fulfillment of that in every way he gave his life for us. Amen. Yeah. So he, he left all of his glory and came in the form of sinful man as a lowly servant. He wasn't a man of high esteem. Who he is, could have, we could say, exalted himself and became king of Israel. And that wasn't what his purpose was. Right. He came as a, a servant. He came to we lay down and he said his life for his friends, for us. To live a life completely sinless and live a life really void of this world and its things and then to lay, lay down his life and death for our sins mm -hmm. there's, there's no greater love than that they so, I remember Brother Rich used to say the greatest love story ever written is in the Bible Amen. And certainly it is far better than any romance novel you can find um, Amen but sometimes I think we overlook his great love towards us. And not only did he die for us, but he also lived for us. Mm -hmm. His only, as you say, stipulation or request is in verse 14, you are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Mm -hmm. We are to display our love towards him by keeping his commandments. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, verse 7. Uh, well, didn't mark it down, but one place it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think it's in First John, he says, that we show our love by keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Well, if we really love God, we'll keep his commandments, we'll serve him. Mm -hmm. I, I know we won't be able to do it perfectly in this flesh, but if we really love God as we ought to, we will strive to serve Him to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. Really, is not that not what Christ deserves, seeing all that He did for us? Mm -hmm. As a great a friend He was for us, should we not be willing to give our lives for Him? Not just in death, but in service as well. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes we're like that selfish friend who only wants what benefits us. We we want all the good things of Christianity, but we don't want the hard time, do we? Right. That's the problem with that health and wealth prosperity gospel day. There you go. It's all about self and what self can get. But for the life of the child of God, it should be about service to Christ, to yes. God. We see two examples in the scriptures of people who are called the friend of God. Abraham was called the friend of God in James 2 23, which references back to 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7. What does it mean that he was the friend of God? We see that it cost him really his family, his homeland, if you will. There you go. It says in Hebrews 11 that he. So sojourn as a in a strange land, dwelling in tabernacles or tents. It says he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. He was a pilgrim and stranger in this world. Mm -hmm. well, that's being a friend of God would mean you can't be the friend of this world. In fact, James four verse four says, "If you are the friend of this world, you cannot be the friend of God." Amen. Friendship of this world is enmity with God. You can't hold hands with the world and hold hands with God. Amen. You can't try to live by the world standards and expect to please God. And it seems the further we go on through time, the 
farther and farther those ideals get away from each other. Amen. Just thinking in our modern society, if you live for God, you'll be hated by the world. It's a, you don't even have to be overly zealous and godly to speak out against the LGBTQ crowd. And right. They won't like you. You can just speak out against feminism and they won't like you. Right. Get off on a slight rabbit trail here, but I don't know how transgenderism and feminism can go together. Right. This shows the, I don't know, the unstableness of the world's theater right. philosophies. And then also Moses was called the friend of God. Back in Exodus 33, it says that God spoke to him as one who speaks with a friend. That was right before he requested to see God in all his glory. Do we have that type of relationship with God that we would be called the friend of God? Hmm. I'm sure there's others that had that. You know, could probably have that type of relationship. Mm -hmm. Elijah seemed to have that type of relationship. But are we so close to God that we would could be called the friend of God or are we just acquaintance that sees him on Sunday? Hmm. I'm afraid many, many professing Christians, that's about the state of their relationship with God is right. weekend visits, if you will. So how well, we ought to be so close to him that we could be called his friend. Well, certainly if you're born again, Christ is your friend. Yeah. Certainly he can even be a friend to sinners. I mean, he was our friend in our sinful state. But are we really friends with God in our relationship with him? Mm -hmm. Are we more like those that just want to use God for our benefits? Or we just have so little fellowship with him that there's really no evidence that we ever walk with him? Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that's the state of many professing Christians today, is it? Right. They have no fellowship with God, therefore they really have no friendship with God. Instead, in the, early, in the beginning, God is not our buddy. He's not going to approve of our sins. He's not going Amen. To... But certainly if we're his friend, if we're walking in fellowship with him, we'll, he will reprove us and rebuke us and correct us and exhort us. He will he'll also pour out his blessings upon us. That may cost us friendships in this world, it may cost us fellowship with family members, it may even cost us horribly possessions. Mm -hmm. But yet to be the friend of God is far greater than all these. As Paul said in Romans 8 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. But it really doesn't matter who is against us if God is for us. If God is our friend, it doesn't matter who our enemy is. Amen. <coughs> Uh, we would probably all be like Elijah when he thought he was the only one left. Right. But yet, he had God on his side. It really wouldn't matter if there wasn't anyone left. Of course, God corrected him and said, well, oh, there's 7,000 men that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Amen. You know, even if there had been no one else, it was like a Elisha and his servant, they were surrounded by horses and chariots. So we have a, a far greater army on our side than the whole world can offer. Greater, Amen. Greater than Russia or China or any of those others. Even if the whole world were come up against us yet, our God is greater. Yeah. And to be his friend is to be, be far greater than to be the friend of this world. Mm -hmm. Certainly, Christ tells us it's okay to have friends of this world that can help you out, but those friends will let you down. Mm -hmm. There's a reason the 
But the psalmist or proverb said, put no confidence in man. That's it. Even the best of friends in this world will let you down at some point. Mm -hmm. will, will fail to live up to the standard that you think they should live to. Yet God will never let you down. He will always love you. He will never forsake you. Amen. You, I'd say, understands even greater than the best of our friends about what we're going through. Mm -hmm. We should always go to Him in times of need. We have full access into the throne of grace, Hebrews tells us. Mm -hmm. Like the song says, Oh, what peace we all can afford. But Amen. Well, we certainly do have a great friend in Christ, and yet. <laughs> I think oftentimes we neglect that friendship with him. Amen. Well, let us walk in the light as he is in the light and have full fellowship with him. Amen. Amen. Amen.